Within evolution, you'll notice that this is the tactic what atheists will always use with you and evolutionists. What they want to do is make you feel dumb for believing in creationism. They want you to feel like that it is like a pseudoscience. They want you to feel like that uh, the scientific community does not believe in creationism. If you are a smart, a really brilliant scientist, you will naturally believe in evolution. Well, that's fooey, okay? I'm going to give you tons of documentations and quotes of scientists, well astounding scientists, who actually believe in creationism and who do not believe in evolution. All right, so here's the first one right here. Not only is evolution all hypothesis, it is a most peculiar and strange one. This is a conclusion of a number of conscientious, uh, conscientious scientists. Let me read it right here. Quote, fundamental truths about evolution have so far eluded us all, and that uncritical acceptance of Darwinism may be counterproductive as well as expedient. Far from ignoring or rid ridiculing the groundswell of opposition to Darwinism that is growing, for example, in the United States, we should welcome it as an opportunity to re-examine our sacred cow more closely. Wow. So this is found, this is found by B. Storehouse, uh, in the, who wrote the introduction to Michael Pittman's Adam and Evolution, 1984, page 12. So let's read some more scientists right here. So, uh, quote, scientists should be willing to accept change as new light comes. We should not remain moribund in an imaginary theory without any evidence. If an idea doesn't work out, it isn't worth holding on to. Why is that? Quote, do not think for a moment, though, that you know the real atom. The atom is an idea, a theory, a hypothesis. It is whatever you need to account for the facts of experience. A good deal will happen in the future, and the changes in our understanding of, the atom will continue. An idea in science, remember, lasts only as long as it is useful. So that's by Emmett L. Williams and George Mulfinger, Jr. at Physical Science for Christian Schools, 1974, pages 662 to 63. Now let me give some more quotes right here. This is by... Uh, Errol White in Proceedings of the Lanian Society by London, 177,8 at 1988. Quote, uh, we still do not know the mechanics of evolution in spite of the overconfident claims in some quarters. Nor are we likely to make further progress in this by the classical methods of paleontology or biology. So you notice right here that they hardly know anything now. And anything, and apparently nothing more, will likely be learned. Here's another one. You're going to find out right here we have faith to go on. For why? There are no facts. Why is that? J.W.N. Sullivan in The Limitations of Science, 1933, page 95. The hypothesis that life has developed from inorganic matter is, at present, still an article of faith. They also call this an understatement. They also call this an understatement. This is by the World Book Encyclopedia. This is by the World Book Encyclopedia, 1988, Volume 8, page 334. Quote, no one should make the mistake of saying that evolution is fully understood. See, it's considered to be an understatement. So um, if they keep questioning our Bible and qu questioning how creationism works, Hey, man, if you're an honest scientist, you're going to be in the same boat as well. You got the same burden as well. Well, that doesn't explain how many animals Noah put on the ark. And that doesn't explain how this thing solves in the Bible and that. Well, what about your scientific theories, my friend? Right. Scientific theories. Not only that, you got a lot of gap in between to explain as well. <laughs> Whereas us, we already have textual evidence right then and there. And because we got textual evidence, it gives you more freedom to critically to critique over there, to critique. How about that? You guys, you retreat to, we don't have an answer yet. Yeah. But science does have the answer. And you think that's like a, a 
irrefutable answer and argument that you get around it. No, that's the same thing with me arguing with my Bible. Well, you know, um, right here, we don't have the answer yet to the Word of God. We don't have all the answers, but we will find the answer. The Word of God will show us. You're going to laugh at us. Amen. Hey, we're in the same boat as you, okay? Here's another one where basically it has... Uh, it does not fit in with reality and practically nothing with science here. This is by George Gaylord Simpson at The Non-Prevalence of Humanoids in Science 143, 1964, page 770. It is inherent in any definition of science that statements that cannot be checked by observation are not really saying anything, or at least they are not science. Look at these guys uh, talking, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and then Richard Dawkins, and then uh, Lawrence Krauss, multiverse, the multiverse, and then blah, 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 you know, stuff like that. You know, I, I can work up my hypothesis too, and you laugh at me when I connect these verses on my own hypothesis concerning four cherubims and cold-blooded reptilians and all that. Hey, I'm in the same fairy tale world as you guys are in, man. We all share something with Star Wars in particular together, you know? These guys, you know, want to give out theories and, you know, this could happen, that could happen, you know, as time passes by. And this sci-fi thing can happen, you know. <laughs> Hilarious. Okay, so let's uh, start off with Romans chapter 1 right here. Romans chapter 1. So what is it concerning about the intellectual realm, intellectuals? The intellectual realm, they profess themselves to be intellectual. It's professing, see? Like a professor, right? Mm. So professing themselves, like a professor, for example, professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Fools. They became fools. Now, it's hilarious that they call creationism foolish, right? So creationism is known to be foolish. However, the more that you study the complexity of biology, anatomy, DNA, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there is no doubt that you can't leave it by itself. You have to have somebody putting everything into place. Creationism is considered to be wisdom. That's how God sees it as. All right, so let's start off with Romans chapter 1. In verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Look at that. So their own God is science. It's the creation of this world. It somehow did it by itself sporadically. That's what they did. Why? Because they don't want to give God the glory for the creation. Look at verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Yeah, duh, when you study DNA, okay? Just study DNA and you'll go, duh, okay? There has to be a creator for that. It's not like you see a Honda Civic car and you go, man, it just happened right then and there, okay? Now, you, now, the atheist will get all mad and they'll say that you're giving a totally different example with the car and a human. That's right, you embarrassed yourself more. A car is simpler to make than a human being. Oh my goodness, man, you just made it worse for yourself. Okay, so let's keep reading right here. Being understood by the things that are made. Well, duh, of course it's understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead. So that what? They are without excuse, truly, absolutely, no excuse whatsoever. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Absolutely right answer. But became vain in their imaginations. That's right, trolling online, you know, vain in imagination. And their foolish heart was darkened, see, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. That's what it is in Romans chapter 1. First fits perfectly to a T at verse 20 through 23 to evolution. There is no doubt about that. This fits perfectly to a T concerning evolution. Now, let's read some more statements right here concerning how there are different scientists, what they believed concerning about evolution. In accepting evolution as fact, how many biologists pause to reflect that science is built upon theories 
that have been proved by experiment to, experiment to be correct, or remember that the theory of animal evolution has never been thus proved. So it's still a theory that stands in splendid isolation from experiment and evidence. Founded by L.H. Matthews in his introduction toward the or origin of species by Charles Darwin, 1971 edition. Here's another one. Uh, let's see right here. Quote, unfortunately in the field of evolution, most explanations are not good. What? As a matter of fact, they, hard, they hardly uh, qualify as explanations at all. They are suggestions, hunches, pipe dreams, hardly worthy of being called hypotheses. Yeah. So that's by Norman Macbeth, by Darwin, we retried at 1971, page 147. So uh, here's another one right here by R.H. Peters in Tautology and Evolution and Ecology. It's founded in the American Naturalist, 1976, volume 110, number one, page one. Quote, I argue that the theory of evolution does not take predictions so far as ecology is concerned, but is instead a logical formula which can be used only to classify empiricisms, theories, and to show the relationships with such a classification implies these theories are actually tautologies and as such cannot make empiric empirically testable predictions. They are not scientific theories at all. Yeah, and the American naturalist, you can read that, okay? Here's another one. This person, Francisco J. Ayala, at Biological Evolution, Natural Selection or Random Walk at the American Scientist, Volume 82, November to December, edition 1974, page 700. Quote, a hypothesis is empirically scientific only if it can be tested by experience. A hypothesis or theory which cannot be, at least in principle, falsified by empirical observation and experiments does not belong to the realm of science. That's something important to underlie before you do some kind of evolution experiments, okay? Before you say, it is science, it is science. No, you gotta think about that as a foundation first. It's a theory, but it's a logical theory. Yeah, we can do the same thing with the Bible too. We can make it logical. Creationism sounds logical too, but does that make it true? See that? They don't think about that. They think that as long as it logically ties in, then it can be true. Okay, here's another one. This is by Luther Sunderland at Darwin's Enigma, 1988, at page 31. It is generally recognized that the original version of a theory might not be entirely correct, but not necessarily false in every respect either. Thus, it is permissible for scientists to attempt to salvage a theory that has flunked a test by making secondary modifications to the theory and trying to make it fit new facts not previously considered. A theory loses credibility if it must be repeatedly modified over years of testing or if it requires excuses being continually made for why its predictions are not consistent with new discoveries of data. <laughs> It is not a propitious attribute for a theory to have required numerous secondary modifications. Some evolutionists misunderstand this and attempt to point to the continuous string of modifications to evolution theory as a justification for classifying it as the exclusive, respectable, scientific theory on origins. They often make the strange claim that creation theory could not be scientific because it fits the evidence so perfectly that it never has required any modification. That line of reasoning is like saying that the law of gravity is not scientific since it fits the facts so perfectly that it never needs modification. All right, so quote by Michael Denton, Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, 1985, page 358. Ultimate, the Darwinian theory of evolution is no more nor less than the great cosmogenic myth of the 20th century. Goethe, uh, he sums it up, Johann von Goethe's, so historical figure, long time ago, 1749 to 1832, quoted in Asimov's Book of Science and Nature Quotations, okay, page 257. 
Science has been seriously retarded by the study of what is not worth knowing. <laughs> okay, here are some thoughtful scientists who have concluded not only is evolution theory a total waste of time, but it has greatly hindered scientific advance as well. Hmm. Okay, quote by Bonor Le Monde et La Vie at October 1983. Director of Research at the National Center of Scientific Research in France. Yep, I mispronounced it. Anyway, quote, Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. This theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. This is the Director of Research at the National Center of Scientific Research in France. Okay, anyways, here's another one. H. Nielsen, uh, Synthet. Tische Artbund, I think that's German, 1954, page 11. Quote, the evolution theory can by no means be regarded as an innocuous natural philosophy, but that it is a serious obstruction to biological research. It obstructs, as has been repeatedly shown, the attainment of consistent results, even from uniform experimental material. For everything must ultimately be found to fit this theory, and exact biology cannot therefore be built up. Another one by M. Denton, Evolution of Theory and Crisis, 1985, page 353. The doctrine of continuity, such as evolutionary theory, has always necessitated a retreat from pure empiricism. And contrary to what is widely assumed by evolutionary biologists today, it has always been the anti-evolutionists, not the evolutionists, in the scientific community who have stuck rigidly to the facts and adhere to a more strictly empirical approach. Here's another one by Colin Patterson in The Listener. He's a senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History at London. He quoted, just as pre-Darwinian biology was carried out by people whose faith was in the Creator and His plan, post-Darwinian biology is being carried out by people whose faith is in almost the deity of Darwin. They've seen their task as to elaborate his theory and to fill the gaps in it, to fill the trunk and twigs of the tree. But it seems to me that the theoretical framework has very little impact on the actual progress of the work in biological research. In a way, some aspects of Darwinism and of Neo-Darwinism seem to me to have held back the progress of science. Here's another one by L. L. Cohen in his book, Darwin Was Wrong, A Study in Probabilities, 1985. It is not, quote, it is not the duty of science to defend the theory of evolution and stick by it to the bitter end, no matter which illogical and unsupported conclusions it offers. On the contrary, it is expected that scientists recognize the patently obvious impossibility of Darwin's pronouncements and predictions. Let's cut the umbilical cord that tied us down to Darwin for such a long time. It is choking us and holding us back. Now, the evidence is myself also at first-hand experience when I was uh, studying research methods and experiments and all that. You know what they started out with? They, the professor started out with something very eye-opening. He said this, major, you'd be surprised, majority of scientists, when they do the empirical experiment, they redo it again. They think, they, they think they're wrong. You know why? It contradicts already their theory that they have faith in believing in. So even if the data conflicts their theory, they believe theory more than the data itself. You see why this is a problem with evolution? They have that much faith in theory. That's the key. They will argue theory as a workable scientific hypothesis, blah, 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 blah. But the thing is this, then what happens then when the data conflicts that? What are you going to do? See, they resort back to faith no matter what. All right. Uh, this, let's close with this last quote, and then I got to give you a whole bunch of scientists, okay? <laughs> Creationists don't consist of dummies. Let's just say that much, okay? They do consist of a, lo a lot of respectable scientists. This is by W.R. Thompson in his introduction to Charles Darwin, Origin of Species. This is what he wrote in the introduction. Quote, I am not satisfied that Darwin proved his point or that his influence in scientific and public thinking has been beneficial. The success of Darwinism was accomplished by a decline in scientific integrity. Now, scientific disciplines established by creationist scientists. Okay, so... 
There we go. On and on and on and on and on. Okay, creationism is pseudoscience. It's for dummies. Look, man, I'll tell you what. Can, okay, then can you name me? Uh, can you name me a bunch of scientists who are creationists, or can you only n name me ten? Now think about that for a while. So before you come up with the biased conclusion that you don't have many respectable scientists, et cetera, blah, 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 creationism does not consist of respectable scientists, why don't you go through a list first of all the respectable scientists? Think about that for a moment. Okay, there are creationists who establish, and these guys are creationists, they believe in a god. They believe in God creating all of the world, all the universe. But they established scientific disciplines today, you gotta understand. They were very responsible for a lot of scientific disciplines today. Okay, so let's, such creationists cover antiseptic surgery, Joseph Lister, 1827 to 1912. Bacteriology by Louis Pasteur. Calculus by Isaac Newton. Celestial mechanics by Johann Kepler. Chemistry by Robert Boyle. Comparative anatomy by George Georges Cuvier, Computer Science by Charles Babbage, Dimensional Analysis by Lord Rayleigh, Dynamics by Isaac Newton, Electronics by John Ambrose Fleming, Electrodynamics by James Clerk Maxwell, Electromagnetics by Michael Faraday, Energetics by Lord Kel Kelvin, Entomology of Living Insects by Henry Fabre, uh, Field Theory by Michael Faraday, Fluid Mechanics by George Stokes, Galactic Astronomy by William Herschel, Gas Dynamics by Robert Boyle, Genetics by Gregor Mendel, Glacial Ge Geology by Louise Agassiz, Gyne Gy Gynecology by James Simpson, Hydraulics by Leonardo da Vinci, Hydro... Hyd Hydrography, I don't know all these terminologies. Hydrography, Matthew Mari. Hydrostatics, Blaise Pascal. Ixtheology, whatever that is, by Louise Agassiz. Isotopic chemistry by William Ramsey. Model analysis, analysis by Lord Rayleigh. Natural history by John Ray. Non-Euclidean ge geometry by Bernard Raymond. Oceanography by Matthew Mari, Optical Mineralogy by David Brewster, Paleontology by John Woodward, Pathology by Rudolf Virchow, Physical Astronomy by Johann Kepler, Reversible Thermodynamics by James Jewell, Statistical Thermodynamics by James Clerk Maxwell, S Stratigraphy by Nicholas Stino, S Systematic Biology by Carolus Linnaeus, Thermodynamics by Lord Kelvin, Thermokinetics by Humphrey Davy, Vertebrate Paleontology by your George Ace Cuvier. Ta another one is notable inventions, discoveries, or developments by creationist scientists. This include the absolute temperature scale by Lord Kelvin, act actuarial tables by Charles Babbage, barometer by Blaise Pascal, biogenesis law, Louise Pasteur, calculating machine by Charles Babbage, chloroform by James Simpson, classification system by Carolus Linnaeus, double stars by William Herschel, Electric generator by Michael Faraday, electric motor by Joseph Henry, ephemeris tables by Johann Kepler, fermentation control by Louise Pasteur, galvanometer by Joseph Henry, global star catalog by John Herschel, inert gases by William Ramsey, kaleidoscope by David Brewster, law of gravity by uh, Isaac Newton, mind safety lamp by Humphrey Davy, pasteurization by Louis Pasteur, reflecting telescope Isaac Newton, scientific method by Francis Bacon, self induction by Joseph Henry, telegraph by Samuel F. B. Morse, thermionic valve by Ambrose Fleming, transatlantic cable by Lord Kelvin, vaccination and immunization by Louis Pasteur. And you got to realize this is that. What's hilarious is that you scientists would not be using all those experiments and tools and all the foundations to prove your evolutionary theory had it not been for the creationists. What did believing in God creationism do? A lot of work on your field today. Yeah. You wouldn't be using them today. You wouldn't be using them to try to disprove the existence of God today. So you might as well thank us creationists for that. <laughs>